Sometimes it may not seem like the most exciting part of our job when it comes to mastering CCNA certification, but it is important to take a look and think about the different types of physical interfaces and cable types that we're going to be working with. Remember, we are going to be focusing on Ethernet. It is just so incredibly critical, this type of technology, and we're going to encounter it both in small office, home offices, as well as medium-sized offices, and even huge enterprises, and of course, data centers. So it's kind of ubiquitous. And one way to do it, of course, is transmitting the data through copper. An unshielded, twisted pair is king in this area. And we see it allowing speeds of one gigabit per second or beyond for distances like 100 meters. We know there are different categories of unshielded, twisted pair. You know, it used to be we were all excited about CAT3 at a 10 megabit per second rate. And then CAT5 came along, which enabled fast Ethernet at 100 megabits per second. But now we laugh at those types of speeds and we have one gigabyte speeds or one gigabit per second speeds being all over the place now compared to 10, 15 years ago. So copper is certainly popular in the area of high speed Internet, but so are fiber transmissions where we have a signal going through a tiny, tiny strand of glass. There's a technology that permits multiple angles of light to be shut down the glass fiber. We call those multiple angles of lights modes, and that is what gives us multi-mode fiber. So a lot of people will misinterpret this. It's a reference to the signal, the angles of light shooting through the strand. And we contrast this to single mode fiber, which is just a single angle being passed through a much smaller diameter fiber. So two very popular ways to do fiber optic transmissions and both the copper options and the single mode and multi-mode fiber options are used in various Ethernet technologies. So here's a chart that I really would like you to, you know, make some flashcards with so you can get a sense for, you know, what standard name goes with a technology. For instance, if you go in the fourth row down, fourth row of data, don't count the very first header column. But so if we go four down, we'll see, in fact, let me grab my pen. I'm being silly. Uh, let me highlight the row that I'm talking about. So if you look at this row right here, for example, it's gigabit ethernet at 802.3 AB as the official standard name. And it's a 1000 megabit per second, excuse me, this is gigabit per second speed technology. And kind of the nickname that we have for it is 1000 base T. Notice with this solution, we are using copper as the transmission medium and the max cable length is 100 meters. So this is a really, really interesting chart, which can teach us a lot. How about running this in your home? Wouldn't that be nice? 40 gig Ethernet. Of course, it's fiber that's making this possible. And as you can see, you can go for really long distances with this high speed technology. That's the type of Ethernet that we wouldn't be surprised to see in the data center, specifically in the backbone of the data center. Another concept that we need to know here at the CCNA level is the difference between what uh, is termed Ethernet shared media and our point-to-point -point media. This is a reference to really legacy technology here. If you have a hub in your network, and you shouldn't today, but if you do, remember that's a layer one device. It can't make intelligent layer two forwarding decisions based on like the MAC address that we have on all of these devices on the network. The hub can only take information in and then spit it out to all of the other systems. Yuck. In fact, an old kind of slang for a hub used to be bit spitter is what we would call these things to emphasize that they are just taking bits in and spitting them out. This leads to a shared media and a very inefficient use of the bandwidth in that environment. So what we love to do is we love to organize in an Ethernet point-to-point -point type situation. 
And this is a transparent switch, as you can see right here, which is going to learn the MAC addresses associated with these servers. And then when one of the servers goes to communicate with another, it is going to be very, very efficient in a point to point type of communication style. So that is how we build our modern Ethernet networks today. And that's almost just like assumed when we start talking about modern networks. Now, another last thing that we want to make sure we cover here when it comes to the physical cabling is the concept of power over Ethernet. This is really neat and actually comes in a couple of different flavors of standard. It's just power over Ethernet was invented in like the late 90s and it's just steadily improved over like three iterations. What we're doing with power over Ethernet is we are not only connecting something like a voice over IP phone or an access point to the network from a data perspective, but we're also giving those devices the power that they need right over the single connection. Isn't that cool? So remember, this is an Ethernet connection like we're used to for data, but it is power over Ethernet that is capable on these ports on the switch and the switch itself, of course, is power over Ethernet capable. And then these devices, they're ready to get their power over their power over Ethernet ports. So we don't have to plug them into a wall socket. No, we have the convenience of giving them the power that they need right over the same Ethernet connection that is giving them the data that they require. So power over Ethernet, a great, great trick that we can utilize to give both data and power to stuff like I've depicted here. Voice over IP phones and access points are two great examples. So you don't have to like learn how to make your own cables as a CCNA. You could survive perfectly fine as a CCNA, never really touching the physical interfaces and cables. Maybe that's been set up for you and your job is to maintain all that. But I'm sure you would agree that it's it's great to know at least the fundamentals about the different types of cables that we can run into and physical interfaces that they'll plug into. And it's important to remember, too, that these Cisco devices are modular in nature, so we can often remove ports of a certain type and install new ports to support some new cabling. So don't be too quick to throw that router away. Oftentimes, you can just replace components in the device for the topology that you need.